The views expressed in this show don't necessarily represent the views of Asheville FM, its board of directors, or any program sponsors. We sat down with three local activists to talk about the proposed Asheville Business Improvement District, a model of service provision using public funding to increase policing in downtown by an unelected and unaccountable body of largely businesses and property owners. For the hour, Grace, Madison, and Elliot talk about attempts to ram the bid through the public process, some of the businesses and individuals behind it, how bids have panned out in other cities around the country, and what space there is left to oppose this further privatization of public space in Asheville. We didn't mention here, but there are also rumblings of the bid model, a version of which has been fought and was never funded in 2012 here in Asheville, being applied to other parts of this city, for example, West Asheville. You can find more information and ways to get involved with folks organizing against the Business Improvement District at AshevilleBID.com. This is our show for the week of May 12th. As a quick note, there are a few acronyms frequently used in this conversation that can get a little confusing. One is RFP, which stands for Request for Proposals and is a process of contracting out an element of a project. Another acronym is ADA, in this case, Asheville Downtown Association, which is an independent pressure group made up of individuals, businesses, and property owners here. Not to be confused with the Asheville Downtown Commission, which was created by City Council and contains appointed representatives from the ADA already mentioned, City Council, Buncombe County Board of Commissioners, and other community members, including business owners. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's going down, and you're invited for what they selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting. Or dying. It's Going Down is a digital community center from anarchist, anti-fascist, autonomous, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial movements. Our mission is to provide an autonomous and resilient platform to publicize and promote revolutionary theory and action. Go to itsgoingdown.org for daily updates. Check out our online store for ways to donate and rate and follow us on iTunes if you like this podcast. On with the show. Hi, I'm Madison Jane, she, they. I am the owner of the House of Jane. It's a salon and production company here in Asheville. Hey, I'm Grace. I use she, they pronouns. And I'm just an avid follower follower of our city's um, increasingly oppressive policies um, in the area. I'm Elliot. I use he or they pronouns. And... (laughs) I do a lot of mutual aid stuff around Asheville, street medic stuff. Um, I'm a graduate student in public health, and I work in homelessness services. So we're here to talk about the proposed bid or business improvement district, which is coming again before the Asheville City Council, and it's caused quite a stir. Likely, many listeners won't have heard about the proposal or the idea uh, might still be new to them. So I'm wondering if you all could give us a rundown of what is on the table with this business improvement district at the upcoming May 14th Asheville City Council meeting and, and what the hell it is. So the business improvement district is a proposal to put an additional tax on all downtown properties. It's currently proposed at nine cents per hundred dollars of property value. Um, And this money would go into a fund that would be run by a completely unelected board that's been handpicked by the Chamber of Commerce, who is pushing this proposal in the first place. Um, One of the big concerns is that on the board, it is predominantly property owners, and three of the seats are slated for people who have over $1.5 million in taxable assets in downtown. This has come up very quickly. We are actually already past the public hearing that was a couple of weeks ago, and they are going to vote two times on May 14th and June 11th to pass the tax and the map, at which point then I guess the community might learn some of the actual details about what all this will entail, which seems like a really backwards way to do things. Is the Chamber of Commerce a public, private, or mixed institution in terms of uh, public accountability and funding? 
it's a private institution uh, made up of like voluntary membership. Um, and, you know, in Asheville, we're seeing a lot of the same pools of people who interact with our, our tourism and development authority, the chamber, and then the steering committee uh, for, for this business improvement district. And when you say voluntary, it is composed of people who own businesses in downtown Asheville who join the Chamber of Commerce. I don't recall if they pay to be members or if they have like what they vote on, whether they make recommendations to city council, whether they just sort of advertise collectively. The ADA that is um, working with the Chamber to propose this bid, they are a paid membership, I believe. And it was described as a tax. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the, that tax would be used to do as far as, I mean, I, I know that you said that more of the information is going to be released during one of these upcoming hearings, but probably if it gets passed or whatever. But um, but what, like, what do people expect who aren't the planners of it for this to actually be? So... Majority of their proposal, $700,000, will go toward safety and marketing. And their main pitch is clean and safe. And beyond that, it is very vague. Grace, I believe you have some of the details that are yeah. from the website of what clean and safe means for them. So the main pitch is that they're trying to hire downtown ambassadors. That's how they branded this, um, which are really street patrols um, that I think they would like to have body cams. Um, they will be going around and um, identifying people who they deem to look out of the ordinary. They will be um, probably reporting around house neighbors to police identifying encampments, it looks like, from what I can tell. And these have been put in place in other communities. Um, and it's really just a strategy for uh, private businesses and corporations to be able to ha exert more control um, over their district areas um, with no oversight or accountability from the public. Yeah, a large part of their operational plan is about that sort of safety policing of homeless people, but these aren't cops. They're not accountable to anyone other than their unelected board with a with a 10 year term. And a lot of the language about their safety and hospitality services is about yeah, identifying out of the ordinary behaviors, noticing antisocial behaviors, reporting them to appropriate agencies. It's about further policing of people who are homeless or perceived to be homeless who are existing in public. And in other bids around the country, these ambassadors are not trained in de-escalation. Um, they are not trained in social work. So there's a big barrier on how these people are going to be approaching our community. There is no... Um, statement there's no job description anywhere that's up to the rfp so the thing about this proposed bid is it needs to be voted in first and then they'll fill in the gaps with all the fine details through an rfp and so we as a community have no idea what this bid will evolve into after it's passed and so in that rfp is where they can decide whether or not these ambassadors will or won't be armed. And if they can ever be armed, it will hopefully give a better idea of what that job description is. Again, none of these details are to come until after the bid is passed. And one of the other important aspects of this is that a, a business improvement district isn't supposed to be replacing, it can only enhance already existing city services. 
So a lot of folks are also talking about how there's a lot of vacancies in city positions for things like sanitation because the city actually still doesn't pay people a living wage. So these people who would be in these ambassador positions, I think in the proposal, they may be claiming that they will be paying them more, which is interesting when we're actually not even providing the existing services, um, you know, if it's really about cleanliness and all we need to pick up, you know, more trash downtown or empty, empty the trash bins, which is why I know that's not what it's actually about. There used to be a model when firefighting was professionalized in the United States, and I'm going to be a little cloudy about the details here, but it was a service that was provided to the individual businesses and homes that paid for the service. And firefighting would just skip by places that were on fire if it wasn't one of their like one of their patrons or whatever so that uh if if you want to if you want to know about how this model of um of public service and its accountability to the general public uh stands then this there's some there's some examples out there i just want to note that since you brought up the firefighters we also are paying our firefighters in Asheville currently 15 dollars an hour um so supposedly these ambassadors would, would make more money than they do which i think is really important and also I wanted to point out that if these downtown businesses are so concerned about these things, literally nothing is stopping them from getting together and donating their money into a nonprofit that they use to pick up trash downtown. Could you talk about that use of the the language of a safe and clean, quote unquote, downtown? And, And this like corresponds to the promotion of a story that downtown has ceded to crime and violence that's been promoted at a national level over the last at least year, maybe two years. I'm curious about how you see this fitting in with the fact that the police can't keep themselves staffed to the their desirable levels and hired a promotional company to do um, PR for them. And, and their supporters have continued to move to increase the funding and or, or get patrols from other departments like the sheriffs into downtown. Yeah, I think the the biggest question is when they say clean and safe, It's clean for who and safe for who. I'm afraid that our most marginalized communities will be left behind in this rhetoric, especially around the the toxic narratives that have definitely enhanced over the last year or two about our unhoused population and the quote-unquote rise in what's the word sorry i can't even think of it because it doesn't (laughs) go hand in hand when i think of our houseless yeah (laughs) even businesses that i would generally consider more progressive i've heard them kind of have more of a, a toxic rhetoric around our unhoused neighbors the thing with the clean and safe is everything on the bid website is very vague They don't really talk too deeply about what clean and safe means until we've gotten into these city council meetings and the downtown commission meeting where we've heard people that are on these steering committees say what they essentially deem as clean and safe and it's getting our unhoused neighbors off of their um, doorsteps. Yeah, I think the the point about who deserves to feel safe in downtown um, is a really important one here because the the language about homelessness feels a little bit hidden behind the proposals. If you look at the text, if you look at the uh, presentations that have been given to city council, the, when they say clean and safe, you know, they're like, oh no, there's trash on the streets. We have to pick up the needles. People are scared. and And it takes a few steps for them to say what they mean, which is we don't want people sleeping in our doorways because we don't want to talk to them. Um, And it feels connected to me to this kind of increasingly violent rhetoric, this very fear-based rhetoric about homelessness. And when I worked, I've worked for a couple of businesses downtown, and I'm also somebody who has lived experience of homelessness. And when I would come in to open up the store, sometimes there would be somebody sleeping in the doorway and you have to say, hey, bud, can you move out of the doorway? I'm going to have to unlock in a few minutes. And it's been a little baffling to me 
to hear business owners speak at city council as if that was like an impossible task. Like, I, I don't think it's hard to just kind of be nice to somebody. And I, I, I think it's notable that the solution that is being pitched here is not more services or more housing or more accessible housing or the solution is, is to kick people out. Like we're not seeing homeless people as people who don't have houses. We're seeing them as people whose existence is inherently criminal. I also just want to point out that by all of even the cops own metrics, so-called crime is down. And in fact, it is the police's own policies that are increasing our, our visibility of our unhoused neighbors as they continue to relentlessly sweep encampments and move people constantly from one location to another um, under threat of criminalization just for trying to even, you know, sit down somewhere. This reminds me of Mike Lamb's presentation to city council. Was it a couple of years ago where he tried to say that the majority of felonies were committed within like a hundred yards of a homeless camp and then trying to figure out where were, do you think those camps were located and what else is in a hundred yards of homeless camps? It turns out it's like basically also a hundred yards of every brewery. I feel like there's, there's been this narrative push, you know, around the idea that homelessness equals crime. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the escalation in camp sweeps is something that's been particularly concerning to a lot of us because we know, you know, when you kick people out of a place they felt safe, even if just temporarily, and you throw away all their belongings, uh, it's a lot harder for them to continue to function and exist. And not to, not to mention the, the impact of being arrested on somebody's access to housing, right? Once we see this, you know, the cops might tell somebody to move along, might show up and clear their camp, might give them a citation, maybe eventually arrest them, might arrest them immediately, depending on, I guess, how they're feeling that day. But then you have somebody who it's now going to be a lot harder for them at some point in the future to rent housing because they have they have a charge on their record, right? And what it has looked like as a resident of Asheville is a desire to try to make downtown more palatable to the tourism economy. Not a safer place for, you know, those of us who live who are also having a hard time paying our own rent. Like, I think we should assume that given the increased cost of living and difficulties, I don't know if we want to talk about the food and beverage unions fights here around income and housing, but the town is becoming increasingly more expensive, difficult to work in, difficult to live in. More of us are closer and closer to homelessness every day, and that's not a problem that can be pushed out just by sweeping up people that tourists don't want to look at. And the irony is not lost on me that they're going to put more guys downtown in polo shirts when the safety concerns that I have personally encountered in downtown Asheville have been with brewery guys in polo shirts who are way too drunk and who are harassing me on the street. That is literally the only time that I personally have have had like a safety concern in our community. And we know that they're not going to go after anyone um, who's engaging in the tourist economy with, with this program. I feel like that's generally my main concern with this pro proposed bid is none of this added tax is going to any fundamental needs that we need to survive as humans, affordable housing, living wages, health care, infrastructure maintenance, none of the proposed bid will go towards any of those things. And to your point, as so many of us are struggling, whether we are housed or not, I'm afraid that this bid is just going to start to create even more barriers for people to be able to live and survive in this town. Yeah, I think a, a part of this discourse that doesn't that's not being centered by the proposal. There's there's underlying the proposal is the assumption that downtown is for the purposes of the businesses to be able to conduct better business. And it's it's not it's not centering the needs of community or talking about the role that downtown could has or uh, maybe should serve 
to the wider community, whether that means a place that people can go panhandle because tourists are down there and they might be willing to give some money or or play some music and, um, you know, busk or whatever. And somebody that I talked to had described the bid as being a development in the model of the mall as this highly controlled space that is for the purpose of commerce that you know, all of, a lot of us have memories of growing up, and there's a lot of stories in the U.S. about people, you know, in their teenage years going and hanging out at the mall because other people are there, and like it's a it's a place that people are able to make niches out of, but it is not a space that is designed or that is organically allows for those sorts of interactions, and it's very easy to get kicked out of a mall if you're not buying anything. And the question of what is the role of this space in our community with real community members is is lost in the way that it's framed during these meetings um especially with like the highly racialized language of social hygienics of who belongs in this space what are the appropriate ways that people can interact with each other in this space and who is meant to benefit is it this like class of people that are going to be coming and buying stuff, staying for a little while and then going away? Is it the people that happen to own a lot of property, however they got that wealth to be able to do it? Um, but those, and I think that those discourses would make a lot of the progressives and liberals, like quote unquote progressives and liberals that are pushing for this model, very uncomfortable um, because they don't want to think about themselves as pushing for what they're actually pushing for. I think one of the interesting things is that they actually haven't been nearly as veiled in their language around this as one would expect. I have heard them directly referencing how basically downtown went into shambles in 2020. They're referencing the uprisings of that time and also a time when temporarily unhoused folks were um, allowed to live where they where they were. They were allowed to stay in place um, until they started the sweeps after that going against the CDC's guidelines. And I think that what's been interesting about this is that there are actually, there are some downtown business owners who actually aren't for this either. I don't think it's just because this is so concentrated in the hotel class, which is, is even different, I think, than some of these smaller downtown business owners. And so it's been nice to see like a broader opposition to this within that but i think that liberalism teaches us that like they co-opt the words and then they they move it around and they say you know like the the idea they actually are trying to bill it as like you asked for this you asked for ambassadors that's what you wanted in you know that that's what we were asking for in in 2020 during the uprisings which is just out, outlandish this isn't what anyone asked for like as an alternative to the police, this is abolishing the police, is replacing them with a privatized army of unaccountable uh, people with body cams. Who who are going to just call the police, which they've made very clear too. Um, it actually took about 20 minutes into the downtown association meeting about this before somebody said, well, why can't we just use this money to hire cops instead? No, thanks. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so... Yeah, there was mentioned that there was a, a past effort in this, and Grace mentioned that it, this is not a unified business owning decision. And Madison has identified themselves as a as a an owner of a business. I wonder if you all could talk a little bit about what you know about that t- failed twenty twelve attempt to create a bid, and you know some of the voices in particular. If you could talk about like the perspectives of people that maybe were in favor of it then, who now are speaking out against this, what they're saying. I heard about this current bid from a business owner who opposed the first bid in 2012 and they weren't sure if they had the energy (laughs) or time to try to organize again like they did 12 years ago. And so that's where I picked up on this. And from what I see is that the, the, first bid was passed and there was enough community organizing that it ended up never getting funded. So the tax was never placed. And I noticed that there were 
at least one to two speakers at the city council meeting that were pro 2012 bid that were speaking against this current bid. And I believe a lot of it is because of the vagueness in this proposal. And so there's a lot of distrust around what it's, there's no clear intentions on what it will actually become. I think another aspect that those folks are concerned about is the makeup of the bid board. So this this board would be appointed and then would be self-appointing from there. So there's really no oversight on that aspect. And I think they're really trying to push this through quickly in this particular year because we're coming up on a tax reevaluation. So the so all of the property taxes are about to go up anyway. So if you're a business owner, that's obviously something you're thinking about. Not to mention we just increased our water rates, we increased the downtown parking rates, and there's a bond that's going to go through. So from a fiscal perspective too, I think there are a lot of reasons why people might push back on this. Also, you're going to be paying even more than what the proposed amount is for for the bid once that reval happens. Um, so I think those are some of the more fiscally minded talking points against this. This current bid is also asking for a 10 year contract before it can be up for renewal with only a five year check in. And when you ask about people who had supported it then but opposed it now at the city council hearing where there was um, substantial public comment about this, I think it was 37 people speaking against and 11 speak people speaking for it. There was one person who got up and spoke and who said that she had, I think, chaired the committee for the 2012 bid and supported it then, but was against the current proposal because of how vague it is. And that was also, I think, a lot of what we were hearing from people who would otherwise support the concept of a business improvement district who think that these safety ambassadors are a good idea. They're looking at the current proposal and they're saying, this is too rushed, this is too vague, we don't know what this means, we don't know how this is going to be implemented. And so it seems like there is a pretty broad opposition right now. You know, it's maybe people who don't want to pay higher taxes, it's people who don't want even more unaccountable police police activity policing happening um and there's opposition from people who would probably want something like this but don't like how rushed and vague it was so i'm hoping that that means this one also gets defeated and doesn't just get further further revised into something that they would want they also pointed out that people who worked on the the 2012 proposal, which is really interesting, is that the consultants, this company Puma out of Denver, who were paid $200,000 for a feasibility study that they're asking for city council to reimburse them for, basically copied the proposal that the community had worked on for years together and then charged them $200,000 for it and put it back forward. So that was another interesting tidbit just because I think it's really important how much of this is is just people lining their friends pockets. I think to your point Grace you know spending two hundred thousand dollars on all their research and marketing for this proposal one of the things that they often say in these meetings of theirs these pitches that is that they have 400 people on board around town that are pro bid and that's over a year of their research and i just wanted to make a little point that we've been able to get over 630 votes on a petition that opposes the bid in one week so i think that just kind of shines a light that like one, we were able to do this for free and actually get input from our community. And two, in one week, we've been able to get more opposition than they've been able to get and pay for in over a year. Um, yeah, I, talking to some folks that were canvassing about this, um, they expressed how surprised some some people, some business owners in downtown were 
uh, hearing about this for the first time um, or having had a rep from the proponents of this come by and, and just being totally turned off by the interaction. It, you know, it sounds like they're just cooking the, cooking the numbers to make it, yeah, promote their, their argument. And this model, like besides the fact that it was tried in 2012, this, this model and even the language of it isn't new or locally unique. Would you all talk a bit about what's known of examples of bids being imposed and in other places and people's experiences with them, maybe? A big pitch from the people that are pro-bid is that there's over a thousand bids across the nation. That to be said, there's over 3,000 towns that are around the same sizes of the t- those 1,000 towns that they say have bids. So more than two-thirds of towns in the U.S., don't have bids and we have a list of about 21 cities that just in the last couple years have defeated bids most recently what we know of up in rochester they defeated their bid for the second time just this past march and a lot of these bids are riddled with civil rights cases across the country i'm personally from California and I had no idea what a bid was until (laughs) April of this year and when I started doing research there are civil rights cases against bids in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego and a lot of those suits are based on either encampment sweeps or destroying people's property especially houseless people. It is putting this, these tax dollars into politicians' pockets. And it's also through um, civ- civil rights cases against um, essentially just feeding police information about our community members. And I think one of the challenges we're facing in our bid fight is just this really short timeline that we've been given um, to push back against this. But like Madison pointed out, we're doing great on our petition so far. Also at the public hearing at city council, there was more than triple the opposition to the bid than there were proponents of it, which is an amazing turnout. Um, As someone who follows city council pretty closely, it was amazing how quickly um, people rallied around it. So I think that we have those things going for us um, in our case. And I'm really hoping that we can defeat it. But, um, you know, one of the challenges of this is that it's not, if you hear business improvement district, I mean, that doesn't mean a lot. It's just nonsense words to put together that you might not realize are going to be this kind of a threat to community. So we've been working to try to give more education um, around this to our community so that we have time to, to push back against it. And I'm really thankful that we have such such a vibrant community that's ready to get involved. And that, unfortunately, uh, what I experienced when I first heard about this bid and tried to talk to more people affiliated with it, I talked to people, businesses on the steering committee, I talked to people that are on the board with the ADA and the downtown commission, I talked directly to the ADA and the Chamber of Commerce, and I was... the. Thing I noticed the most is they have a very, um, very pretty script that I was being fed. A lot of the same words were coming from completely different people, as well as I was continually told that everyone wants this bid, everyone is on board with this bid, and that this bid is inevitable. Like there was nothing that could be said or done that would stop it from happening. And when I started reaching out to community, talking to people that work downtown, businesses downtown, so many people didn't know about this bid. And what I realized is that I was just perpetually being gaslit by these people that are proposing this bid 
essentially trying to make me not question anything about it, saying that, oh, yes, it's the great thing. It's going to happen. Don't worry about it. And I'm worried about it because something that's supposed to be for the community doesn't seem to have a lot of community input. It also, Madison and I attended the Asheville downtown meeting about this, and it actually became abundantly clear during that meeting that the the committee, mem the downtown commission members themselves actually don't understand what a bid is. Um, and they were being asked to make a recommendation on it, and they were asking very basic questions that we don't have the answers to, and they seemed confused. So that's how quickly they're trying to to move this through so that there is no time for public input and questions to be asked. And speaking of public input, the fact that we only had one vote or one public input available before it was what six weeks before the not even six weeks my goodness it was just two weeks ago so four weeks prior to city council's first vote was when the only public hearing was that public hearing they changed the time of when the public hearing would be three times leading up to that hearing at first it was at 7 p.m on a tuesday and then it was at 4 p.m that tuesday and then they told us to show up at 3 30 to sign up for public hearing and so when we, i got there at 3 15 to sign up they were already letting people sign up so they started letting people sign up early only to be told that they had changed it again that day to 7 p.m and that we they didn't know even city council members didn't know if we were going to be given two minutes or three minutes if they were going to allow everyone who signed up to speak or if they were going to limit it to one hour and so even just trying to show up it was extremely hard for people to navigate how to show up when to show up and not everybody has the luxury of sitting around for five and a half hours and even during the meeting they tried to change the time they're just like well we're all here so let's start talking now at five o'clock when initially they said it was seven o'clock so it was just like such a cluster cuss even just to get public comment and it almost seemed intentional like they didn't necessarily want to hear us i don't think they would make it so difficult for people to show up if they actually wanted to hear what we had to say and also worth noting that those times are not that there's a perfect time for any like for everyone ever for something like this but if the concern was actually about public input doing it during what are considered quote-unquote regular business hours especially for people that have to think about child care like are working a job don't have easy access to transportation it's like pretty high barriers for for public participation let alone those time changes you were talking about huge time and on top of that the the next public hearing through the downtown commission was at 9 a.m on a friday so a lot of barriers were being laid for general working class people to be able to show up at these meetings i know it might be speculation but because People who were concerned about this were able to rally three times as many people to this meeting in such short notice and have been doing been doing a lot of work stamping the concrete and like talking to people and, and knocking on doors and whatever. Does it seem like they sort of thought about this as kind of a last minute effort and they're like, oh, shoot, we could just push this through. They're going to be ignorant, and not be able to do anything about it. Or does it seem like this is a well-oiled machine or some mixture of the two? I don't feel that it's a well-oiled machine. Just the fact that bids have been around for over three decades and they don't have a very clear proposal, it just shows me that it's not a well-oiled <laughs> machine. If it's something that's been so successful time and time again for over 30 years, I would expect a very clear documentation or document on what is to be proposed and expected down to every single tiny detail. So I do feel that it could possibly more, be more of a, let's just rush this in and then kind of figure it out as we go or be able to control. I 
I do feel this is a power grab. I do feel this is about privatizing our public spaces and the sooner they can get it in and not have the community push on it, I think is beneficial for them. I think the Chamber of Commerce is really counting on this tight timeline because they made it abundantly clear once in the downtown commission meeting when people started asking questions about, well, can we adjust this here or adjust this there? The Chamber made it very clear that there is a point at which they actually would no longer be interested in having a bid at all because they wouldn't be able to have their handpicked rich board in charge of it. And I think that that is very telling. And I also think that there's another political dynamic at play, which is that some of these same folks have um, who are pushing the bid have actually been really hard and on and nasty to our city council um, complaining that they're, you know, that they're terrible at their jobs. And I mean, in fact, part of their pitch is like, well, the city sucks at doing all these things. So let us do it instead. We're nimble. We can be nimble. So I think that's another interesting thing that has unraveled as I've watched this. I was going to say, I think what is well oiled about this is city council's lack of concern or regard for people who are service industry workers, for people who live downtown, who are not, you know, major property owners, hoteliers. I think they're pretty practiced at the kind of disregard that led to them rescheduling public comment so many times. I do think that in the event, which hopefully won't happen, um, that they pass the bid, knowing that there is a point at which the chamber will no longer even want this thing is really important for people in the community to understand because there will be a point where they're doing this request for proposal. And if it becomes so odious to the, to the chamber of commerce, I think that there could be you know, potentially another situation where we would, I guess, maybe even just at least be able to reel back the power of the bid in terms of not giving it to this unelected board, which actually is not necessitated by by the state statute that outlines um, a business improvement district is actually technically a municipal service district. And there are other communities who do not have um, an unelected board who controls these funds. I think to that point too, Grace, is something we learned in the city council and the downtown commission meeting is that legally city council can have full control of this bid. This specific proposal is asking for a management company to be handling it and the ADA and the chamber of commerce intend to make a 501c because that's what has to, if there is a management, it has to be a 501c. They intend to come together to create that 501c to be the managers of this bid based on the RFP and whoever pitches for this bid, city council can decide to go with a completely different management company or no management at all. So again, that's where there's just a lot of gray area with the bid. Once it's passed, it can literally become something completely different than this current proposal. We're going to have to out nimble their nimbleness. Nimble was their favorite word alongside yeah. clean and safe. <laughs> I think you, I think you'd asked about like lessons in other places fighting bids. And I, as you know, we've already said, I'm really impressed that Asheville was able to bring three times as many people in opposition with extremely short notice. I mean, I think we were planning around that for what, like a week, maybe two weeks to try to, to try to round people up. And I feel like there's been a lot of groundwork in the kind of relationship building and conversations that led to people who are against this kind of thing, bringing it up and talking to each other about it. And I know Madison, the conversations that you've been having in Grace, that you've been having um, with other business owners, with other involved parties. Um, I think the opposition to this here in Asheville now, you know, rests on that work that was done in 2012, but also on this kind of ongoing relationship building groundwork that 
a lot of people I'm in community with here are trying to engage in constantly so that we're able to respond to this kind of stuff when it comes up. And it's not just a single issue, you know, that we were trying to organize around. I think that I want to say something about like being prepared for whatever fight (laughs) is that comes or whatever, being prepared for whatever issue we need to try to respond to. To add on to that, to your question of um, if we have any any success stories from other cities, we have a list of 21 cities, including Asheville, that have rejected a bid. Some cities multiple times, including Rochester in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Their bid was rejected to, due to a lawsuit that vote collection was illegal. And um, beyond that, I don't have the fine details on what the organizing looked like or what the fine details were of how these other cities were able to have their bids rejected. But we're looking at Philadelphia, St. Paul, Bristol, UK, even um, Sarasota, Florida, Kansas City, Birmingham, Alabama, Alabama, Atlantic City, New Jersey, all across my hometown. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all across the St. Paul. Um, yeah, we have a, a whole list of cities just in the last decade that have had bids rejected in their towns. I do think, I don't know much about Atlantic City's efforts, but I know that it's like the highest union density city, um, I believe, in the country. And a lot of um, New Jersey bids have been uh, rejected. And I do think that our coalition with Asheville Food and Bev United, which represents our downtown service workers, you know, I think the power of the workers who are maintaining their livelihoods in downtown Asheville and really, really have a huge stake in this is so important. And I'm just so appreciative of the way that they've showed up for this. It's interesting to to point back to what someone had said about how even if people can't get a total no vote on it, if people can shift the what is passable to something that the chamber doesn't want maybe they'll drop the effort although maybe just after it got passed the city council would shift it back to something that people expressly don't want but i don't know that that seems to open some possibilities i do think that that's an important you know possibility that we have to consider um and i think that that will be our next job if that I we right now one of the things that's baffling about this is we actually have no idea where our city council members stand on this issue um I only feel confident that I know one no vote on city council for sure and there's one other person who I think is almost certainly a yes vote that being Maggie Ullman who had the nerve to say at the city council meeting that um that we need all the help we can get uh, while the city is literally criminalizing people for distributing food and resources in our community. Um, So I hate that kind of hypocrisy. But I think after the May 14th meeting, we'll have a much better idea of where the the city council members are standing and also if there might be room um, to move from there before the next vote on June 11th. Yeah, I guess, well, my next question was going to be about, like, who was backing it. And it's already been referenced that it's it's not clear how the politicians are, are sitting for the most part. Um, hoteliers have been brought up in here as a as a class that are backing this issue. But I wonder if there are any other if there are any particular businesses that are that y'all are aware of behind this effort so that people could go and talk to them and say, we don't you know, this is not a thing that we want. Or is that something that y'all are proposing? Yeah, I th- the on the steering committee, there's Spicer Green Jewelers, and the owner is on that downtown commission board, and they were the one person on the steering committee that I heard express very violent rhetoric around our houseless community. They said that they felt very uncomfortable when they would show up to work and somebody was sleeping in their doorway and that they have called police 
multiple times with no, nothing happening. And they were also one of the ones in that meeting that was pushing for the ambassadors to be armed if a bid gets proposed. I'd like to call attention to JB McKibben, who is the owner of Hotel Eris downtown and actually stood at the council meeting and said, I own 10% of all commercial property in Asheville. So uh, he's our local Jeff Bezos. Um, I remember him from such hits as allowing snipers into his hotel to point at, at uh, protesters in 2020. Um, I also remember um, a photo of, I believe, his father circulating on the Internet of him wearing blackface. And he said, that's that's my wife, but that's not me. But I think we were pretty sure about that. So he's like one of the more despicable ones. I want to call out Tupelo Honey, Burial, Brewing, Wicked Weed. These are some places where you, folks who listen may go or not want to go anymore. And then other hotels and banking and commercial real estate interests, Biltmore Estate, of course. Some of those that you named are local, are local businesses, or some of them are local businesses that were franchised, or were sold and then franchised out to other areas. Like Tupelo Honey, I think, was originally from here, but they've got a number of Tupelo Honeys around the southeast. Wicked Weed was purchased by Anheuser Busch, and so it's yeah, it's interesting. I wonder, did um. I know that one of the businesses that sticks in my mind or one of the business owners that owns multiple businesses that signed on to the request for the sheriff's department to do patrols downtown to move along homeless folks is, uh, shoot, Spicewalla and... Chaipani. Yeah, the Chaipani business, which also owns a restaurant in West Asheville. They owned um, Buxton Barbecue and uh, shut it down. In October, November, also put like ruining a bunch of people's jobs. Yeah, yeah I, th I think to that point, um, to kind of tie everything into the violent rhetoric around our unhoused neighbors, uh, Chaipani, along with a few other restaurant groups, signed an open letter to city council asking for more policing around their businesses. And so I think a lot of that ties into those are the same businesses that are calling for this bid because they do want more privatization of their public spaces. They want more policing of their businesses. Um, when, you know, I think something that we don't consider is how many of these people working in these restaurants, people that are dishwashers, that are service service workers, how many of them are houseless? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that's something that we talk about when our minimum wage is $7 and 25 cents and it hasn't changed in over a decade, you know, I, and back to the point that this bid does absolutely nothing to focus on the needs of our actual community. It's not talking about how do we stop people from facing houselessness? How do we stop people from becoming these quote unquote unsafe and unclean things that people are uncomfortable seeing around their business. And I think that's, that's where my fire <laughs> for um, just sharing knowledge around this bid is really relayed around because we, I see endless calls for mutual aid every day on the internet for our local community members that are barely making it by they're barely making their rent their cars aren't able to get them to work you know none of this is actually going to the real needs of our community that is hurting on so many different levels this bid is made to add on to the services that we don't have in the beginning, it, to begin with, our social workers aren't getting the funds that they need. Back to the point that our firefighters only make $15 an hour. Our The core services of our city aren't isn't getting the funds and the attention that it needs to even try to add something on top of that that's from a private entity that has very specific and very close-minded 
ideas of where that money is going to be spent. So I know that um, I know that uh, it's been mentioned that there are there are two votes coming up for this that are necessary, and uh, it's been mentioned also that there has been a lot of going door to door, a lot of talking to people, a lot of organizing, coordinating, and trying to get people in a room together to discuss, to think about, and to share their perspectives. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else about the sort of methods that have been employed in this coordination to oppose the business improvement district in Asheville that maybe you'd want to highlight kind of quickly um, that maybe people in other communities that are facing a similar thing could be able to employ. I I think I would just point to what Elliot was, was talking about earlier about having networks that are prepared to respond. And also I hope that this allows people who may have not had a a bid proposed in their community yet know more about it um, so that they can get the word out about it quickly um, when it comes up and hopefully you're given more time than than we are um, because once people start to get to know this thing it's it's fairly easy to understand why it's not something that that we would want Um, and yeah we're using you know petitions canvassing um, and also just just talking to our neighbors um cool then um what are yeah and what are the next steps that people can get involved with or or ways that they can learn more from from uh what you're offering what information you've collected or or plug into the process if you go to ashevillebid.com it has a few different links one of our main asks is for people to look at the petition, which has a lot of different links to different things about bids across the nation. It also, our goal is to get it to a thousand signatures by the May 14th city council meeting. So that's our our biggest push. Our second ask is just for people to continue to share the information with their neighbors, with other businesses. I think it's really important if anybody has direct contacts or relationships with our city council members to try to have conversations with them about the harmful impacts of the bid. We would also like to see more downtown businesses that are opposed to it being vocal in the sense of putting a sign in their window or having flyers to the petition and more information about the bid in their businesses that can be shared um, with the, within the community. You can also follow No AVL Bid on Instagram, where we'll be posting updates. And you can message that account if you want to volunteer to canvas the community with this. Um, we're asking for support at that May 14th city council meeting because while the public hearing has already officially occurred, that doesn't stop us from continuing to speak at city council meetings. Is there anything that I didn't ask about that y'all wanted to mention that just, you know, fits in this framework and maybe, maybe, or j- maybe just occurred to you and I didn't make space for? Yeah, there was one thing that I wanted to add when you were mentioning how this bid sounds a lot like a mall. For me, not only does the bid sound like a mall, it was the foundations of a bid was based on the dynamics of a mall. For me, I feel that this bid sounds a lot more like redlining and Jim Crow segregation and urban renewal. And on the point of urban renewal, if anyone is interested, Grind AVL Coffee Shop in the River Arts, they just put up a massive historical mural on an entire wall inside their business that shows the history of urban renewal here in Asheville and how devastating it was to our Black community in the late 60s and early 70s. We lost over 1,000 homes to urban renewal and over 50 businesses around Asheville in predominantly Black neighborhoods. And so a lot of this bid and privatizing public spaces, these power grabs, of public spaces sounds a lot like the dark history that Asheville has already 
seen and experienced and its repercussions have been felt over generations. And my fear is that this bid will be another one of those things that is negatively felt over generations in this town. A great way to remember if you want to talk about the bid is a lovely acronym that we borrowed from our friends in Rochester, which is that the bid is crap, corporate redlining and privatization. Very catchy. <laughs> Thank you all three of you for being a part of the conversation and um, for the work that you're doing around this. And uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> the trout. Just remember the bid is crap. The chambers never had our back. Just remember the bid is crap. We want safety through love and care. Not more harm for all people here. So I can't say without fear. We don't need no council of millionaires. So look out Asheville, avoid the trap. Just remember the bid is crap. Councils never had our back. Just remember the bid is crap. Now some of you folks might be wondering what exactly I'm talking about when I say the bid. It's the B-I-D, or Business Improvement District. That's what they like to call it. We think a better acronym is C-R-A-P CRAP. Corporate Redlining and Privatization. Now that came our way through folks over in Rochester, New York, who had a similar group of people put forth a similar sort of thing for their town and they would do similar sort of things in their community and well they rightfully got together and fought that thing off let's try and make sure that goes the same way over here in Asheville look out Asheville avoid the trap just remember the bid is crap this TDA's never had our back just remember the bid is crap John McKibben and Spicer Green Don't give a damn about people's needs So they put out something really got me teed With a whole new host of property fees so Look out Asheville, avoid the trap Just remember the bid is crap Chambers never had our back Just remember the bid is crap Feed the people and keep them housed there's enough to go around Help your neighbors, it's not that hard Save our city from the oligarchs Look out, Asheville If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf support. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Let's talk about violence. Every time I turn on the news... The lead story is about the violence on America's college campuses. The struggle to end the genocide in Palestine has escalated to mass occupations of university commons by students and by a class of people now known as outside agitators. The Diploma Industrial Complex and its bean-counting fart goblin establishment, seemingly taking the side of order at any cost, have called in law enforcement to clear out the encampments, repeatedly resulting in mass arrests. This has quickly escalated to forcible occupations of buildings and offices by students and outside agitators, who, upon entering the buildings, technically became inside agitators. And of course, the university fart goblins called the cops and had them hauled off too. All of this has continued to escalate, so that now there are regular clashes with police. On the news, we see images of protesters fighting with police, throwing objects, using homemade weapons. Unlike a couple months ago, when peaceful protesters nonviolently occupied a bridge in New York, right down the street from all the major news networks, and no one showed up to film it, 
these violent clashes have captured public consciousness. Everybody's talking about them. It's even an issue for the octogenarian meat puppets running for president. Well, not running. More like doddering. They're both doddering for president. At any rate, they both condemn the violence. One of them has talked about using more force to quell the violence. You know, employing more violence to produce less violence. Well, the guy sleeping in office right now, between nappy times, has pontificated about the difference between constitutionally protected speech and violence, and how violence must be unequivocally condemned. Politicians everywhere have condemned the student violence. Well, violence by the students and by outside agitators and by inside agitators. The condemnation of student violence has been bipartisan and universal, almost the only thing that everyone can agree on, that student violence is wrong. Given the massive amount of attention provided to student violence, you would almost think that it was American college students who systematically slaughtered more than 4,000 Palestinian children. I mean, the outcry from those in power has been so loud and unanimous that you would almost have to think that university students have racked up some kind of crazy body count, you know, that might rival, say, the Israeli Defense Forces, who have indiscriminately murdered tens of thousands wholesale. With some of those in power who condemn the university students not saying a word about the genocide. <clears throat> what strikes me in all of this is the multiple layers of hypocrisy and cowardice. First, we've got a crime against humanity systematically carried out by an occupier rogue state propped up with U.S. lawyers, guns, and money. Plain and simple. And so, U.S. taxpayers, U.S. citizens, are really perpetrating a genocide by proxy. U.S. missiles, U.S. bombs, U.S. bullets, U.S. vetoes of U.N. Security Council resolutions. Second, We've got a militarized police force showing up in riot gear with automatic weapons and Humvees, body armor and shields, military-grade equipment that was donated to local police forces by the Department of Defense. So when we're talking about cops, we're not talking about Officer Friendly from 1950 helping little Susie get her cat out of a tree. We're talking about highly trained military troops in tactical gear hopped up on adrenaline and on the excitement of finally getting a chance to try out all their new toys on honor students with laptops and book bags. None of that violence gets our collective attention. No. The public focus is on the unreasonable, irrational, and unjustifiable violence by those crazy college students as if the protesters had marched to the police station to pick a fight with the cops, rather than the actual reality that the cops marched to the university to pick a fight with the protesters. So, whose violence is it? I find it curious that anyone buys the false narrative of protester violence when you have steroid-pumped war dogs in battle gear showing up to the campuses with single-minded designs to sweep and clear, the same terminology used by troops in Vietnam who burned Vietnamese villages. Somehow the violence is attributable to the protesters? Something I think I need to say to the protesters directly. What you experience now didn't start when you occupied your campus. Those bone-snapping cops were trained long ago. And all of that equipment was cataloged, inventoried, and distributed long ago. Those armed enforcers have participated in mock-ups, training exercises, preparing for the event of unleashing their state violence on you. On you. They've just been waiting for you to show up, to forget your place, to give them the excuse to become what they've always been. All of this preparation to unleash violence has been going on since before you set up a single tent, probably since before you enrolled, maybe since before you were born. 
your government has long been ready, gearing up for this violent clash with you. You. It's considered you a potential enemy, a potential threat, since you were obliviously coloring inside the lines and eating all of your vegetables. And now here you are. Government is a violence machine. It's an enemy of freedom. So if you think political violence is not the answer, you're asking the wrong questions. Fight and win. The ground you're standing on is liberated territory. Defend it. Please feel free to share this audio on campus or anywhere else so I can be an outside agitator, or really, an inside agitator. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.